balanced ride on this. In principle, we're keen to support all of the recommendations, but having not as yet seen them, we obviously can't responsibly make a comment on that yet. Phil Shorten, welcome. Good morning, Barry. That concern that if you punish the banks in a certain way, then credit might dry up. Is that a reasonable thing to keep in mind when you decide on penalties? There they go again, the government. They already sound like they're backpedalling on making the banks accountable. Let's see what the report says. The reality is this is a government that can always find an excuse not to do something to bring the banks into heel. I mean, is really what Mr Morrison's saying, that the only way that we can have a solid banking sector is an unethical banking sector? I don't buy that logic. But maybe that explains why the government voted 26 times against this Banking Royal Commission. 26 times. And basically the big economic plan that the government's had for the last six years for Australia is to give the banks a $17 billion tax cut. Yeah, but, he, but he wants an effective banking system as well. He doesn't want credit to dry up. Barry, is this Liberal government, this protection racket for the bank scandals and rip-offs we've seen, are they really telling Australians that the only way that we can have a banking sector is to have an unethical banking sector? I don't buy that, nor do thousands of small businesses, farmers and people have been ripped off by the banks. I, for one, have been shocked. I pushed for the Banking Royal Commission against the government. They mocked me, they abused me, but in the end we got our way. And now it sounds like the government's trying to say, well, maybe we need to have a bad banking sector to keep a banking sector. I don't buy that. So do you commit to adopting all of the recommendations of the, the Royal Commission? Well, in principle, I mean, it'd have to be a pretty amazing reason not to. I mean, we saw that remarkable proof of life video where poor old Commissioner Haynes has done a great job. He's sort of dragged out to try and give some faux credibility to a government who didn't want to have a banking royal commission. I'm not going to let the government off the hook. They didn't want this. And now they're already trying to say, well, maybe we need to have an unethical banking sector. We don't want to go too hard against our friends in the banks. You've come up with a recommendation of your own around the uh, new protections for whistleblowers, but it's this financial incentive that's thrown in there as well. Why is that there? Well, we have a look around the world and the Americans have been able to make some big breakthroughs in some financial scandals by basically encouraging some of the people involved to be able to come forward and get a reward. I mean, what our plan means for people who are doing the wrong thing is that just beware of the person next to you because they might just want the reward and not put up with the uh, corruption. I want whistleblowers to come forward also, whistleblowers pay a big price. I, there's a lovely fellow, Jeff Morris. He's paid a big price for coming forward about the Commonwealth Bank and he, you know, he's suffered great financial disadvantage. Are we a country who says we want people to sacrifice everything to expose illegality or corruption and then we punish them? Because what happens is when a whistleblower comes forward, they get punished in many different ways after the event. So we're trying to redress the balance, but I'm determined to make sure that the big white collar crooks, the top end of town, next time someone cooks up a scheme to park, you know, a couple of hundred million dollars away from, you know, the eyes of the tax office, when mum and dads have to pay their taxes, we want to say to whistleblowers, we've got your back. But you talk about white collar criminals, and in this case, that's your targeting, and, and yet you oppose an ABCC in, in the area of industrial criminality. No, I think there's a big difference there, Baz. First of all, what we are saying is that in workplace relations, just one set of laws. Why do construction workers have to have a different set of laws to all other workers? It's not fair. But we oppose uh, illegality wherever it is. But one of the weaknesses being that whistleblowers haven't been rewarded. What we're proposing today can apply in any workplace, but any that, workplace. Couldn't that be the risk, though, the reward? Could be quite large. It could be as much as $200,000 in big cases. Could that lead to vexatious claims? Well, if you think that we're catching all the... If you think that we are hearing all of the uh, insider deals that go on... Well, I don't share that view. Labor is going to pursue and make sure that we restore faith in institutions, not just the government. We push the National Anti-Corruption Commission. We also want to make sure, and we push the, the Banking Royal Commission. So we've been fed income. Our record is there. But we want to make sure that whistleblowers don't get punished. I don't believe in a system where we encourage whistleblowers, but then we see them financially disadvantaged. I want to ask you about housing prices now. In, um Housing prices have gone up in Sydney and Melbourne by close to 10% in the last 12 months. There are predictions that uh, have, have fallen by 10% and the predictions are that, that they might fall by a similar amount or even more in the next 12 months. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, prices go up and prices go down. It really depends if you're trying to buy a house or sell a house. But I think the real issue that the government's been getting at is that they're trying to scare people about our sensible reforms to wind back 
taxpayer handouts to property investors. Because that might cause houses, the house prices to fall even further. Well, first of all, let's look at where the house prices have fallen. They've fallen under this government. This government wants people in Australia to forget that we've got twin problems. And one problem is that first home buyers don't get a fair deal. How is it fair that a couple in their 20s or 30s go along to bid for a house and they're competing against someone who's getting a taxpayer handout to buy the house as their sixth or seventh house? So that's just not fair. Everyone knows it's not fair. But as usual with the government, if they're given a choice between standing up for ordinary Aussies or standing up for the vested interest, they pick the vested interest, just like they've done with the banks. But the other issue is that if this government is saying and trying to scare people about our very modest proposals, then what they're also doing is they should take responsibility for the housing price falls on their watch. You never hear them do that, do you? Somehow they want to scare you about stuff, which even the Treasury Department says will only have a modest impact. Yeah, but, but they want you to gloss over the fact that under this government, our economy's underperformed. It hasn't performed in the interests of working Australians. But will your, your changes in negative gearing mean the houses will be even cheaper? What our changes will mean is it'll be fairer. In terms and cheaper? Well, I'll come to cheaper in a second. I'll come first of all, let's deal with fair. This is the real reason we're doing it. How is it fair, Barry, that a couple have to compete to buy their first home with someone who's getting a taxpayer funded handout to buy their sixth or seventh home? In terms of the impact on prices, it will not have the negative impact that the people trying to promote and oppose our current scheme are saying. Absolutely not. Even Treasury who, as we know these days, write reports for the government on their side, even they've said they'll only have a modest impact. But by a modest in impact, it will cause a further decline in the price of houses. No, no, I don't accept that. I accept yeah. that what we're doing is creating fairness. Now, a lot of the How can it not have that impact? Well, first of all, the only way that uh, you could follow the government's logic is if you would stop investing in property in Australia. The reality is most people invest in property because it's a good deal. Some people do it to get the taxpayer handout. How is it fair, Barry? that some people are able to access a taxpayer handout to buy their sixth or seventh house and the rest of us or the rest of Australians can't. On the franking uh, credits issue, and do you concede that's causing you more political harm because it's not grandfathered? And do you also concede that some of the people who will take a hit here are not wealthy? Well, first of all, just on this issue about grandfathered, you're quite right. When it comes to negative gearing, uh, all of the people who've currently negatively geared will not be affected. And you'll still be able to negatively gear but from your houses. that doesn't apply with the franking credits. Well, in the franking credits, that's still prospective. Listen, without sort of, you know, everyone being bored to tears about the issue, in 1987, Paul Keating introduced a scheme, basic principle of tax, tax equity. He said that you shouldn't pay tax twice. So a dividend that a person receives is taxed in the company, company tax, and then it used to be taxed as income, income tax. He removed the double taxation. But in 2001, John Howard and Peter Costello, when they had more money than they knew what to do with, abandoned tax principles. And now we've got a crazy situation where a taxpayer gets a credit, oh, sorry, a non-taxpayer gets a cash tax refund. What principle of taxation, Barry, says that a person who doesn't pay tax can get a cash tax refund? Let's open the textbooks. It doesn't exist. But it does exist, and a lot of people have relied on it for a long time, and you are copying um, um, some backlash over this. The government's making quite something of it. Are you prepared to have another look at it? Well, first of all, the reason why we're doing it is that there's no principle which says it's fair that people, that a non-taxpayer gets a tax refund, a cash tax refund. But it's also not fair that we're spending $100 million a week paying non-taxpayers cash tax refunds. And it's not fair in this country that we pay, spend more money giving non-taxpayers a tax refund than we are on public schools. So we're not for turning. I mean, it really goes to a deeper point. This government's run out of governing. They don't even want to turn up to parliament. They just want to scare people about our sensible reforms, which are about making Australia fairer. So when you say you're not for turning, there'll be no tweaking of the policy at all? Well, if I can put it really directly, do people want a government or do they want a piece of plasticine? Do people want a government with tax principles and fairness at their core or do they just want a lump of political putty? We've had six years of the Plasticine government and we're putting our views out because we want Australia to be fair and we want it to operate in the interests of the millions of people who go to work every day, the pensioners. Did you know, Barry, for example, that we're handing back bigger tax refunds to 10 million Australians than the government's currently offering? Get someone in. Get someone in. Collapse. It sounds like a... Sorry, um, 
We're, we're just going to go to a package and we'll come back to you. Good. Well, we've got a bit of a problem in the studio. Mm. Time flies by in the yellow and green. Stick around and you'll see what I mean. Today I announced that I'll be an independent candidate in the next federal election in Warringah. Today I'm announcing that uh, I intend to stand at the next federal election. Sally Stegall announcing her run in Warringah against Tony Abbott yesterday. Oliver Yates declaring his taking on Josh Frydenberg in the seat of Kuyong and now Julia Banks in uh, Flinders against Craig Hunt. We have lived here um, on the Mornington Peninsula for over 20 years. Well, I wouldn't want to be in Greg Hunt's shoes today. I will uh, let uh, uh, the individual in question explain her own actions. I'll be riding shotgun underneath the hot sun, feeling like someone. I'll be riding shotgun. Climate change action policy is something that's really, really important to them. It's time for real action on climate change. Because if we go past another four years where we don't act on climate change... Everyone I speak to in Flinders... I will be speaking on behalf of the people of Kuyong. The people of Warunga have had enough. Time flies by in the yellow and green Stick around and you'll see what I mean Look, I can't tell you exactly what Josh Frydenberg's views actually are. I look forward to the contest. Unfortunately, he's not holding the views of the electorate. What can you offer the people of Rohingya that Tony Abbott can't? Bali. 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 I've never been complacent about this seat. He just wanted to say I left the Liberal Party yesterday. <laughs> Did you? Well done. <laughs> I well, there you go. So how worried is the government about this latest threat from an independent? I'm passionate about the seat where I grew up. Greg Hunt has worked like a Trojan for his community from the day he was elected. He was up to his neck in getting rid of Malcolm Turnbull and now the chickens have come home to roost in the form of the very formidable Julia Banks. I really am optimistic that Australian politics can be brought back to an even keel. Bring the Liberal Party back to account. Bring it into line and stand up. I'm used to a tough race and I'm, I'm ready for it. And just to explain what happened there, one of our cameramen had a bit of an episode. Um, he, I, he seems fine, but we've got an ambulance on the way. Um, so, Bill Shorten, if we could just uh, round off the interview, sure. what I did want to ask you about throwing forward um, to the sitting fortnight, um, you seem determined to put up the, um, the new measure to deal with unwell um, uh, refugees on, on Nauru. Are you pursuing that and do you think you have the numbers? Well, we'll be pursuing it. It really depends what sort of pressure the government's brought on the crossbenchers. I should say, though, that I am pleased that the final children are off Nauru. And I do believe that if the crossbench and the opposition and some of the uh, progressive Liberals hadn't pursued this, I do wonder if the children had been off. And I think it is also correct to say that although he was my rival, former Prime Minister Turnbull, the American deal, which we backed in, so I am pleased with this development, but we want to keep making sure that we treat people uh, with a proper duty of care and with access to proper medical treatment. Because of that development, though, do you think that will have an impact on the thinking of some of the crossbenchers? And I'm thinking Cathy McGowan in particular, that she might now be satisfied with that and she won't then support the Labor initiative. Well, Ms McGowan's always said that she's concerned about uh, all of the people in detention, not just the kids. But that, that, I'm not going to put any more pressure on. I'll leave that to the government. In terms of the sitting fortnight, though, one thing which I'm determined to do is to hold the government to account to the fact that they've only scheduled 10 sitting days in eight months. You know, Barry, as people come back from their Christmas holidays, imagine if they go into their boss and say, listen, I've been thinking about it. I only want to come to work for 10 days in the next eight months. You get shown the door. And that's really what I'm going to be saying to the government. Turn up to work, schedule more sitting days. And if they don't do that, I'll say to the Australian people, if you want a change in the government, then change the government. Thanks for coming this morning. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.